Hello there. I hope people can hear me. I'm going to get my chat thing up here. Hold on. I've got to get my chat up and going. Got to get my chat up and going. There we go. And hooray, I'm in. All right. I'll move that over here. And we'll, what is this? This is, what is that? Oh, we don't need that one. Do I need that one? I'll go ahead and copy it. Anyway, just in case something is there that we need. Well, hi, gang. Here we are. Um, I normally do this uh, on Fridays. Today's Thursday. So I didn't know I was doing Thursday. But now I know. And here I am. So I'll wait to see if somebody can type in that somebody's here. I will be glad to uh, continue this uh, lecture. Today we're going to talk about um, rhythm and rhyme, and how that <clears throat> how that affects um, songwriting. Um, but I don't want to start until I know someone is here, and uh, we'll just wait and see if someone is here. I'm uh, got my chat on. Uh, maybe the uh, the creative vets can just put a thing in there saying you know donate. Uh, this is a Thursday, although I, I think this might be another giving, another um, donation day. There we go. Hi. Yep, yep. Good, good. And there's Porsche. Good. Is now hosting. Good. Excellent. All right. Um, all right. And there's uh, Timothy is back. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. That's wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so uh, today's lecture is going to be on uh, on rhyming and 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 rhythm, line rhythm. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's first of all uh, talk about rhythm, and then we'll get into rhyme all right now <clears throat> when we talk about rhythm in a song <clears throat> i'm talking about line rhythm all right now to give you an example of line rhythm let's say um let's say uh, uh let's see let's pick let's pick a line here um i'm just going to make up one make up a, a, a line that would be like a physical line, a line of, uh, that starts a story. Um, like, um, she saw him sitting at the bar. She saw him sitting at the bar. All right, I'm gonna write that down because we're gonna, we're gonna manipulate that quite a bit, all right? She saw him sitting at the bar. Okay. Now, the line rhythm, let's say that's a line of a song, right? She saw him sitting at the bar. And then we're going to say, let's have another line, uh, when he turned and said, hello. We don't, I don't know if we're gonna need that, but we're just gonna write that. Turned and said, hello. All right, now, when I talk about line rhythm, this is a couplet, this is an asymmetrical couplet. 
and I'll explain why that is in a minute. But um, she saw him sitting at the bar. So there is, this is what I call natural line rhythm. This is the natural line rhythm. When I, when I read this on the page, it says, I saw him sitting at, the, she saw him sitting at the bar, right? When he turned and said, hello, all right? Oh, actually, hello, uh, that, that is actually a symmetrical line, a symmetrical couplet. She saw him sitting at the bar, And I'm going to put, and said, and she said, you've come too far. All right. Okay. So the natural line rhythm for this is she saw him sitting at the bar. So that's three stresses. She saw him sitting at the bar, right? Okay, now, I just wanted to show you what line rhythm is. It's a, it's a, it's a line that's, that has stresses, stressed syllables and unstressed syllables. In this case, the natural line rhythm is, we put a stress on, saw him sit, on the se part, not the ing, se ting, se. She saw him sitting at the bar, and the, the bar has the third one. All right? That is the natural line rhythm for this song. All right? Now, um, before I forget, I would like to thank Creative Vets. I, I need to, because I'm just starting to settle in here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Creative Vets for allowing me to uh, have this time with you. And I would encourage everyone. Um, it's good to see you. Awesome ketchup. Um, I, would, uh, I would like to say that uh, today is another day for donating uh, to Creative Vets. So if you would uh, kindly, uh, sometime during this uh, lecture, or any time before or after, it would be great to uh, to if you could send them some uh, a donation, because Creative S is a nonprofit, and as you uh, probably know, it is uh, do dedicated to um, veterans, uh, especially wounded veterans, veterans that have had a hard time overseas, uh, or maybe even in this country. Um, at any rate, uh, what we're doing here at Creative Vets is to convert the um, the military mentality, the the uh, soldier mentality, the warrior mentality into creative mentality. Right. So that's what we're doing here today, and what we're always doing here, <clears throat> either painting or sculpting or writing books, writing poems, or in this case, writing songs. So if you would uh, feel the kindness in your heart to send a little money our way, um, someday I might even make some money. What about that? I don't know. It's crazy. <clears throat> okay. So there we are about creative vets, and we love them so much. Um, so let's get back to our natural line rhythm. She saw him sitting at the bar. Now, before I start breaking that down, because we're going to break it down, I wanted to mention the some basics about line rhythm. And that is... Many experts say that rhythm is the most important aspect of songwriting. Yeah, really. Most important aspect of songwriting. How can that be? 
Well, let's, I, I, I give an example. I've done this uh, before, but I'm going to do it again. Because they say repetition is the key to learning, right? Okay, so let's take a song without any rhythm. Da 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 What about that? It was pretty boring. Yeah. Now let's let's just take all the notes and let's just whittle it down to the most basic of notes that same melody, but this time I'm going to give it the rhythm, the line rhythm that it, of the original song. So, check this out. Da, 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 You see what I mean? It's far more interesting, the second version. I took almost all the notes out and just did a very simple descending line. But the line rhythm made it interesting. The song was, of course, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Da 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 but if you take the line rhythm away, da 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 you know, it's like, who cares? It's just a bunch of notes. So, rhythm is really, 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 really important for songwriting. So, I'm stressing that you songwriters out there pay a lot of attention to the rhythm of your song to the rhythm of the melody and of course the chords as well but you know we're talking mostly about melody today right and uh, well we're going to talk about lyrics a lot but right now we're talking about melodies how important melody is so now <clears throat> let's let's look now that we know how important it is Let's look at one of the reasons why I love writing songs, okay? Love it. So let's look at our line here. She saw him sitting at the bar. That's the natural way. So if I was going to play that, I could go, um, I could go, uh, she saw him sitting at the bar. You know, slow it down a little bit, maybe. She saw him sitting at the bar. All right. Now, if I was a poet, <clears throat> by the way, just so you know, this is um, my guitar is tuned down to D. And um, hold on, let me make sure. Creative vets, somebody's calling me. I want to sure, make sure it's not creative vets. No, I don't know who it is. Okay, we'll just stop that. Um, <clears throat> so, this guitar is tuned all the way down to D. So when I when I have no capos on it, it's in D. So when I make an E chord, it's actually a D chord. So I've got it tuned up to normal tuning. So if you were to copy me, it would sound the same. And I've got a three string capo, which I've showed you before in previous um, sessions, uh, it, it forms a, uh, uh, like a dad-gad tuning. It's uh, <clears throat> in the Nashville number system. This is the one, which is the key that it's in. This is the key of E. So one, and then the fifth note of the scale. So we call that the five. So this is one, five, one. Isn't that 
interesting. That's a four. So it's one, five, one, four, five, and one. So there's a little four in there, which makes it. Interesting. I, I didn't know that I, I, that little four snuck in there, right? So this, if I put my fingers on the this string right here, on the B, and then here, I'm, I'm getting that unison. Now I've got nothing but ones and fives when I do that. This is like because I notice I didn't change the tuning, so now I'm playing the. I can play the. I can play the. Let me see. Let me get. I can play these chords the same way I would play them normally. So here's a D, and here's a G. Here's an A. But you can muffle that last string. So you see, I, I have all this strange tuning where it's one, five, one, five, one, one. That's called a modal. Where it's just ones and fives. Uh, and <clears throat> what happens is you don't have a three. Well, let me put the three in and you'll show you what I'm talking about. That's a three. One, two, three. You see how, how soft that is? But if we take the three away, it's real harsh. And you can't tell if it's a minor or a major chord, because there's no three. The three makes a major or a minor. That's a flat three. wanted to show you a little bit of what's going on here. I, I particularly like to play in the three string mode. I just like that modal. It's really powerful. And so I, I play a lot in it. I just didn't want you to be going, what's he doing? What is that? Well, that's what we're doing with that. Okay, let's get back to line rhythm. So we go. Uh, she saw him sitting at the bar. Or you could do it in a sort of a pop sound. She saw him sitting at the bar. Well, we'll just stay with the sort of the country vibe. She saw, she saw him sitting at the bar. Now, watch this. Because we're doing songs and not doing poetry, I can change that line rhythm. I can force that natural line rhythm to be whatever I want it to be. I can make some notes shorter. I can make some notes longer. I can make pauses in that line. <clears throat> Just to show you how important 
rhythm is. Like if I wanted to make, let's pick one of those words. If I wanted to make she the important word, I could go, she saw him singing at the bar and he thought it was a little too far. See, and, 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 and I could make, do the same thing with the bar. I could do a she, she, she saw him sitting at the bar. Da, 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 da. See, so I can, I, I made him more important. She, she saw him sitting at the bar. He turned and said, hey, and you've gone a little too sitting at this bar you know it's my bar you know so the point making how important line rhythm is we can take in other words if I was a poet I would never say she saw him sitting at a bar no it's the music and the line rhythm the melody that makes it all so magical and wonderful songwriting she she See how cool that is? I just turned, I turned two lines into quite a long piece by simply doing repetition and doing some surprise, um, what you would call like forcing the line rhythm to be um, musical rather than natural, right? She saw him sitting at the bar. She. So that's the point I'm trying to make about about uh, line rhythm, and 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 its importance. Uh, so knowing how important it is, and knowing that we can force natural line rhythm. So you young songwriters out there, when you're writing, uh, and you're you're writing your line, don't necessarily go with the natural line rhythm. Look at the look at the line. And say to yourself, I wonder if the word she is more important than any other word. She saw him sitting at the bar. Right? And she said you come a little too far. Come a little too far. A little repetition there. You come a little too far. Hmm? Come a little too far. This is my bar, right? Or you could go, this is my bar. So I could, again, take the natural line rhythm there and stretch it out to make my point. Hmm? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Rhythm is, it, it's everything. It really is. It's just most, 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 most amazing stuff when, when, we come, when it comes to songwriting. Now... Let us talk a little more about line rhythm. Let's go to couplets, all right? Let's go to couplets. Now, most songs are written in sets of two. Sometimes they're written in sets of three, okay? So I will say that. So, uh, and possibly sets of four as well. But for today's lecture, we're going to just talk about, for now, we're going to talk about Couplets, two lines. You have a setup line and then a follow-up line, right? So there are two ways to do these couplets. We can do symmetrical couplets or we can do asymmetrical couplets, all right? And now let me just look at this.
Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm making up stuff as we go, all right? So you have to stay with me here. Okay, good. Now, um, so symmetrical couplets, let's, get, let's, let's give you an example. I'm going to use this thing that we came up with. She saw him sitting at the bar. That's three stresses. If you wanted to do a natural one, uh, usually lines, not usually, but often lines are four stresses. So we could say, we saw him sitting at the bar downtown. We could, we could put downtown in there if we wanted to. This will keep it more, the most natural. Uh, I mean, not the most natural, but the most common is a uh, most common line is four stresses. So uh, um, a, a symmetrical couplet would both have four stresses. All right. So she saw him sitting at the bar downtown. Now, I often talk about this and I will continue to talk about this because I think this is so important to writing really interesting songs, keeping people's interest. What I have done is I have set up an expectation. She saw him sitting at the bar downtown. Right? Now, your ear wants to hear dum dum ba da 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 dum dum ow. I'm writing here. Okay, so this is what we're expecting. We're expecting she saw him sitting in a bar downtown and she said, I'm glad you said, I'm glad you came around. Right? So once we've set up a line, as long as it's four stresses and three, or three stresses to the line, uh, the expectation is you're going to rhyme the next line, right? She saw him sitting at a bar downtown, dum bum bum dum 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 down, right? That's the expectation on a four stress line. Even on a three stress line, it's the same thing. She saw him sitting at the bar and said you've come too far, right? So once we get into two stress lines, things change because the line's so short, you can do either rhyme or no rhyme because the line's so tiny. She saw him there. See, that sounds normal or uh, She found some ground. That also sounds normal. That's two stresses. Or uh, she found, she found some ground. She found her way. Because they're so short. Again, we're not, we don't, we're not too concerned about whether it rhymes or not because there's no, there's not enough reference. There's not enough stresses. But she saw him sitting at the bar said you've come too far. That's a symmetrical couplet. The stresses are in the same place. She da bum da ba da la da dum bum dum bum dum bum right? Same place. That's a symmetrical couplet. Okay? Symmetrical couplets, we want to hear them rhyme. Right? Now let's do an asymmetrical couplet where the top line and the bottom line don't match, okay? Okay, let's do a four stress line for this asymmetrical couplet example. 
Let's do a four stress line and then a three stress line at the, uh, on the uh, underneath it. And that's very common, by the way, four and three combinations. So she saw him sitting at the bar downtown when he turned and said hello. Okay. She saw him sitting at the bar downtown for when he turned and said hello. Three stresses. Right. Now that sounds normal. Notice they did not rhyme. So asymmetrical couplets don't want to rhyme. Our ear does not hear it rhyming. But what it does hear is it hears the setup for another set of asymmetrical couplets that'll complete the rhyme. So to give you an example, she saw him sitting at a bar downtown when he turned and said hello. She said, what you doing in this? She says, what you doing up at 10 p.m.? And he said, heck, I don't know. Right? So there was another four and three. Right? I'm pretty proud of myself. I came up with those little quickies there. Um, so asymmetrical couplets do not want to rhyme but do want to have two more asymmetrical couplets, notice that the second line and the fourth line will rhyme. The first and the third line do not have to rhyme. They can, they can, but, but, but they don't have to. Now, awesome ketchup, I know you're gonna to relate to this. We have to have our coffee, right? We have to have our coffee middle of the day, hey, who cares? Coffee's coffee, right? So, it needs to be warmed up. There's a microwave right here. So we're going to go over here. And we're going to warm it up a little bit. There we go. Ah! Coated Nutrina. Nutria. Coated, coated Nutria. Hey! Good to have you aboard. Love to have you here. We're talking about line rhythm. And uh, eventually, if we have time, we'll talk about rhyme. I'm not sure how much time I have today. Uh, maybe someone can tell me uh, that might be listening. Not sure. Um, we haven't had the normal. Usually, someone comes in and says you can donate to Creative Ets, And I haven't seen that yet So on the chat. So... Uh, we'll just go until someone tells me different, I guess. Uh, so, so, symmetrical couplets want to rhyme. Asical, asymmetrical couplets do not want to rhyme but they want two more asymmetrical couplets to complete the rhyme, all right? So this is important because songwriting is all about compelling emotion, right? Am I right? Yes, it's all about compelling emotion. So knowing how to manipulate emotions to me would be very important to know when you're talking about songwriting. So, if we set up expectations and then don't give them what they're expecting, that sets up an emotion. That sets up tension. Because they're, un they're not expecting it. So they go, oh. It also kind of gets their attention to it. It sets up tension, but it also gets their attention. So both... Both kinds of tension, attention and tension that needs to be resolved, right? So let's give let's give an example here. She saw him sitting at the bar when he turned and said, oh, you're expecting, oh. so she saw him sitting at the bar when he turned and said hello. 
Now that sounds a little bit off, a little bit unexpected, not terrible, but it, it has that little bit like it's it sounds a little out of balance because even though they have the exact same stress, there wasn't a rhyme. And it'll even be more noticeable if we stretch it out to four stresses. She saw him sitting at a bar downtown when he turned and said, Hey, you, hello. You see how you really got it then? Whoa, that really sounds, you know, what you wanted to hear is, she saw him sitting at a bar downtown and said, Hey, I'm glad you came around. You see how that just sounds like, wow, that's great. But when I go, she saw him sitting at a bar downtown when he turned and said, What you doing here? Whew. So that was really unexpected. So when you do, when you pull that real unexpected thing, like two, like symmetrical couplets that don't rhyme, especially when they get that long, three is noticeable a little bit, but four is really noticeable. And anything a after four is extremely noticeable. Oh, here we go. There we go. Join our Discord. There we are. A space to chat. Good, good. Yes, yes. Wonderful. And um, we also might want to... Uh, give the, where we can uh, where we can donate because today's a donation day uh, I take it and so uh, <clears throat> it'd be great to uh, to highlight the, the donating um, there you go check it out creative vets donate to creative vets there's the donation there you go good good all right so now you know I've got mine over here on the side of the screen here. I don't know, maybe some people choose to have it over here. I'm not sure which way it goes, but do what you can, reach in your pocket. I know it's a, it's a tough time right now, but uh, it'd be wonderful to, uh, you know, to give when you can. Uh, especially now, I, I, I think, I'm not sure, but we may have some matching funds today, which, so if you give today, uh, that money will be doubled, um, so that would be that would be really that would be really lovely if you donate today. All right. All right. Oh, that's so delicious. Um, okay, so we we just did an example of a symmetrical couplet. They match perfectly but they didn't rhyme. So what's going to happen now? They didn't rhyme, so we didn't get a sense of uh, satisfaction at all. We got a sense of, ah, yeah. So the only thing we can do now is just do what we would do with a, an asymmetrical couplet. We're going to do another set of couplets to get, him to, to get it to rhyme. So she saw him sitting at a bar downtown. He turned and said, hey, turned and said, you've come too far. He walked across the room and then he asked her kindly where you are. Now, that doesn't make any sense at all, but at least you got the idea. I mean, it sort of made sense, but then it didn't. But you're getting the idea of what has to happen? You create a, you create a tense situation. So, when you're writing a song about a tense situation, you can do write sets of four and make them symmetrical, but don't rhyme them. So you get a so you get a, a rhyme scheme which we would call A B A B or X A X A, meaning X means no rhyme. So the first line wouldn't rhyme. The second line will rhyme with the fourth line, right? And the reason for that is when we set up a section, like let's say this is a verse, the ear wants to hear, well, as you can tell, the ear wants to hear several things, which we've already gone over. But another thing the ear wants to hear is the ear wants to hear the last line of a section. We would like to hear that rhyme. So... 
any way we can get the last line to rhyme is what we're going to try to do, right? <clears throat> so I just did. When I, I went da 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 town, da 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 far, ba da 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 bar, right? So the second and the fourth line rhyme, right? But at, in the meantime, we've created tension in this song. So that's really going to help. We, we, we've already found out from this fake little song that I'm writing that obviously they're unexpected at this place. The person walks in and sees this guy, this girl walks in and sees this guy, and she goes, look, I don't know, why are you here? You're usually never here. This is weird that you're here. You've come, you've gone too far, right? <clears throat> By coming to this bar, right? So the same thing now happens with asymmetrical couplets. If I go, <clears throat> let me figure out how I'm going to do this. Okay. She saw him sitting at a bar downtown and said, I'm glad you came around. See what I mean? It's like, whoa, you didn't want that to rhyme. Your ear's going, ah, why did that rhyme? I, I didn't want it to rhyme, right? I wanted it to go something like, she saw him sitting at a bar downtown and she said, you've come too far. That sounds normal. But when I do, she saw him sitting at a bar downtown and said, glad you uh, said, I'm glad you came around. Wow. See, see the, the tension that that, that creates? It, it rhymed, but even though it rhymed, you're going, I need something's not right about it. It's, 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 uh, it's off center. It's like, so again, you created some wonderful tension in a song. What? Song that has tension. So you see, this is really, this is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. Knowing how to manipulate a listener, right? It's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. So these are tricks that you can use to, once again, create interest by, by creating little surprises, right? Little surprises that, you, that the audience isn't ready for. We've also learned how to take natural line rhythm and change it around any way we want. She saw him sitting at a bar downtown. She saw him sitting at a bar downtown. I just rushed it. She saw him sitting at a bar downtown. She saw him sitting at a bar downtown. She saw him sitting, saw him sitting, so I went. She saw him, she saw him sitting at a bar downtown. So, I mean, there's so many, those were pickup lines. She saw him, earth, da, 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 sitting. So I, the, my first stress was on the word sitting. So I had three unstressed syllables before the first stress. She saw him sitting at a bar downtown. So I'm, I'm compressing it, right? Pushing it tighter. And then we can stretch it out. She saw him sitting, sitting at a bar downtown. When he turned and said, God, you came around. That's the wonderful thing about music is you get to do, the, get to play those wonderful games, musical games. Again, every creative moment is different. And so it's whatever you're feeling like doing, right? That's what we do. Um, let me just say... Oh, I, I might as well... I like to say this um, during every lecture at one point or another. Um, the three basic tools we have besides our wonderful imagination which I call our spark, right? We have spark, which creates stuff, right? The spark of our imagination at any given moment, which every given moment, by the way, is, is unique and new and different. Every creative moment is different. No two creative moments are alike, which is, again, kind of magic, right? Like Dylan says, everything's changing. Everything's changing. <clears throat> so... 
once we once we've had this magical mysterious thing that comes out onto a tape recorder or a, a, or a computer or you know into a mic and it gets out on paper now we've got this is what we can do with it the three basic tools is we can find unique details that's the first one is unique details so <clears throat> if we haven't written our first draft with a smattering of uniqueness in our details then I would rewrite it and put in some unique details take out some of the generic stuff uh, the shallow pool you know we uh, we think uh, songwriter, well, not songwriters, people think um, in a very shallow, uh, in a very safe way because we don't want to, you know, we don't want to show radical emotions every minute of our lives, right? We want to we wanna live up here where it's safe and polite, right? But what we want to do with songwriters is we want to learn how to dig down and get, you know, and get those uh, those deeper things. And that requires, oftentimes for me at least, it requires at least a couple of rewrites. So I actually, I absolutely love rewriting. Because I'm a professional, I, I love the idea of rewriting even more than the initial write. To me, rewriting is so much more important than the initial idea, than the first draft. I consider a first draft like a frame of a house, but there's no drywall, there's no roof yet there's nothing there's just a frame and then i like to fill in all the unique details the furniture the flooring the rug the you know the countertops uh the mirrors you know the lighting all the stuff we want to think about and so to me this is the this is where you know the 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 amateurs are separated from the professionals because professionals take the time to find some unique detail now there are so there are exceptions to this, uh, which we probably won't go into today. I'll talk about that some other time. Um, uh, but I will give you a hint: if you're if you're writing all shallow writing, chances are you better have some great music and some great line rhythms, interesting line rhythms and interesting rhyme schemes. All right, that's just to give you a little hint. Of what you might want to do <clears throat> again because we want to keep people's interest all the way through from the beginning of the song bing bing to the middle bing 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 to the end so we want our we want our arc to go up oh, let's see which way we're going up and down right we want that arc that nice arc we want to keep the interest going going up so um one of the things that will do that is unique details sprinkled in amongst the generic stuff. The second thing is contrast. And we can contrast any part of our, of our songwriting elements. There's 14 songwriting elements. Um, um, I don't know if I can get into all that right now. Um, let me just see. Uh, I can't find yesterday's Monday's paperwork. Kind of disappeared here. In amongst all that, I'm producing an album with a with a, a friend of mine, and uh, my paperwork gets mixed up. Oh, maybe it's over here. Here we go. Here we go. All right. I'm in the process of uh, writing a book called Songwriting Dangerously. And so some of these ideas that I have <clears throat> are new. And so because they're new, um, I have to look them up now. I haven't memorized them completely. All right. So the 14 elements are, I'm just going to say these quickly, and then you can rewind this tape later and, uh, you know, and write them all down. But what we have is, first we have the, um, the concept. Let me put that in there because that's not in there. And I hope these are going to come out. 
Let's see if they come out to 14. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, thirteen. Oh no, they're, uh, they're, they're 15. Okay, there's 15 elements. And that is first the concept. Number two, the genre that you're in. You want to learn the language of whatever you're, whoever you're singing to. You want to learn that language. That's called the genre. Um, then you have form whether it's chorus or non-chorus. Then you have, then you have uh, the lyric elements, the actual lyric elements, which are four is person, first, second, and third person, whatever you're going to use in the song. Five is the place, um, one place, several places, or no place. Uh, six is time, very important element, time. Past, present, and future, ongoing, or no time. You know, um, also, place can be traveling too. That's that's a you know one place, many places, or traveling, like six days on the road is traveling. Okay, um, seven is emotions. Uh, we have all the emotions. Yeah, they're wonderful and they're used a lot in songwriting. Eight is figurative writing, which is um, you know um, it's symbolic writing. Like I'm going to the Big Apple. The Big Apple is a symbol for New York. Right, um, uh, the cat's out of the bag. Right. Well, that just means you know something's been revealed. Uh, that's symbolic writing. Uh, uh, f number nine is conclusions. When we when we from our from our living, from our experiencing life, feeling those emotions, we come to we draw we come to conclusions. Like we're all we're all dust in the wind. That's a conclusion, right? They're fun to write sometimes, to come to those big conclusions. And number 10 is development, how we're going to develop our story, whether it's going to be story-driven or whether it'll be emotionally driven, right? And we get deeper into that later. And number 11 is rhythm. Number 12 is rhyme, right? Hey, Bubba, good good uh, have you, having you here. Thank you for joining in. Um, so that's what we're talking about today is rhythm and rhyme, which are the 11th and 12th um, uh, songwriting elements. And then uh, 13, now we you notice that rhythm and rhyme are the bridge between, between lyric and music. Is the rhythm of the lines and the rhyme of the lines, right? And now we get into melody. We get into, that's 13. 14 is chords or harmonies. And 15 is a, is a sneaky one, which a lot of people, especially when they're young, don't pay attention to. But we pros pay a lot of attention to it. It's called texture. So during the, <clears throat> during the, during the um, verse, we might go... That's a particular tension, uh, texture right there. And then, and then uh, during the pre-course we might go. And then. You see, that's just texture of a guitar. There was three different textures there. That, and then in new new test new uh, textures. Textures are really 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 important. They really brighten the song, especially when you feel like, you know, the arc of your song. Where's the arc? It's on this. The arc is going up. And then it's starting to level off a little. Ooh, we don't like that leveling off. So throw in a little new texture. There's your contrast, right? Texture. You can contrast the texture. Oh, I, yeah, I got distracted, didn't I? Yeah, well, I'm very ADD. Sorry about that. Uh, the third uh, songwriting um, tool we have is repetition. 
So the, the three tools are unique detail sprinkled in amongst the generic. Unique detail, contrast, and repetition. And how these three dance together, right? How they dance together is your creative process in that particular day and how you're feeling that day. Every day is different, all right? So those three things, we're always, I'm always developing and thinking about details that are unique, contrasting, which creates also interest. All these three things create interest to a degree. Um, obviously, if you contrast too much, it'll drive people crazy. If you repeat too much, it'll drive people crazy. Uh, too much unique detail, well, you can overdo it to where it becomes too personal and suddenly your emotion, the universal emotion that you're trying to sell the audience, because let's face it, songs are nothing more than three, four minute advertisements for the emotion that you're trying to sell. And there's always one emotion. You're always selling one thing, right? Because you only have three or four minutes. It's a little tiny, little tiny um, story, a little vignette right? The vignette can be story driven or it can be emotionally driven, but either way, it's a little vignette that has to do with your life or someone else's life, and it's emotional, right? One thing, one thing, not two. Okay, good. All right, so we got that, we got that uh, discovered. Now, um, moving on to our Lecture about um, line rhythm and rhyme scheme. All right, now let's get into it. Let's we've covered um, we've covered um, rhythm pretty well. Now let's move into rhyme. Okay, um, rhyme scheme is is absolutely wonderful and expected, right? When you start to hear a song and you hear somebody sing, you're expecting them to rhyme things. That's just because in poetry, you don't have to rhyme if you don't want to. Poems don't have to rhyme. But songwriting, the listener wants to hear some rhymes, right? Are there songs that don't rhyme? Yep, there are. And that is a topic that we might be able to cover today. Let's see if we can. But first, let's talk about rhyme first before we talk about songs that don't rhyme. There's few of them, by the way. There's not that many. There are a few that don't rhyme. Uh, so it's not that important to know that particular trick. Um, OK. There are, there are basically, when you think about songwriting, there's basically two ways, two places you can rhyme. You can rhyme at the end of a line, which is what we normally think about as rhyme, but you can also rhyme inside the line too, all right? So let's cover end rhyme first, and then we'll talk a little bit about rhyme that goes inside the line, right? Okay, now... Um, Remember we talked about detail, contrast, and repetition. Well, obviously rhyme is repetition. It's a repetition of a sound, right? So we can contrast rhyme by simply changing our rhyme scheme between sections. And how many sections do we have? Well, we've got... 11 different possibilities of sections that we can do in a song. And in today's songwriting, the more sections it seems the merrier because people have such a short attention span that when you throw in a new section, it creates interest because it's contrasting what they've been hearing, right? So 
if you have a line that's going da 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 bay da 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 fine da 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 ging da 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 blind da da way da da say da da play da da go da da low da da no see how that you just went whoa how interesting but I did I did continue rhyming it but I shortened the lines I rhymed them quicker and I rhymed three lines in a row, bing, 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 whereas the other one was like, no rhyme, rhyme, no rhyme, rhyme. It was two asymmetrical couplets, right? So what I'm showing you is contrast each section. The verse will have one rhyme scheme. The pre-chorus will have another. The chorus could have another. And if you have a bridge, the bridge could have even another. And if you have an outro, the outro could have yet another kind of rhyme scheme. So rhyme is an opportunity. It's a repeating opportunity to contrast. So even though rhyme is repeating a sound, you can repeat it in contrasting ways, right? So we're, again, watching that, trying to keep that arc, rising, rising, that arc of interest, right, over time, yeah, oh, good, thank you, thank you, wonderful, wonderful, oh, I got, I got a thousand, that's wonderful, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, for those, yeah, and I got a rainbow, yeah, Brett Fire shot me a rainbow, that was wonderful, thank you, are we on channel four now, looks like the little peacock, um, all right, so we're going to talk about end rhyme first. Now, end rhyme, there's two ways to rhyme. Somebody's walking around my house. Okay, that's my wife. Uh, end rhyme can be either perfect rhyme or, or soft rhyme. Or slant rhyme. Oh, this is it? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Three minute warning. Ah, okay. Good. All right. Well, we can wrap this up in three minutes. Okay. What I encourage you to do is hard rhyme. Well, perfect rhyme is also called hard rhyme. And the reason why I kind of steer clear. I don't steer clear of hard rhyme. That's, that's the wrong thing to say. But I encourage myself and my co-writers to come up with soft rhyme. That's rhyme where the, the vowel sound is the same, but the consonant is different. So light, notice the I, light, can rhyme with crime, like t and m. Those, so that's not a perfect rhyme, but in the modern day of songwriting, there's nothing better than a good soft rhyme. Reason being, why? Because it's unexpected. It creates a little surprise. And surprise is part, falls under the category of contrast. Right? So you're expecting one thing, and then, oh, you have this other little thing, which is contrasting what your brain is expecting. Again, setting up expectations. Da-da-da-da-da-da, light. Now the expectation is another it sound. Da-da-da-da-da-da, it, ba-da-ba-da-da-da, ein. Ah, a little surprise. Still works, because you still hear the I, right? So I, I encourage surprise and uniqueness. Perfect rhyme only has so many, so many um, possibilities, right? Like love. There's only like four words that rhyme with love, right? Well, if you go to Wiki Rhymer, 
dot com. I think it's dot com. It might be dot org, but I think it's dot com. WikiRhymer dot com. You will find if you get the pro version, and the pro version costs somewhere around ten or eleven bucks a year. If you get the pro version, you will find over a thousand rhymes to the word love. Yeah. So, and they're all little surprises like love was. They rhyme. Love on. Love on. Leprechaun rhymes with love. See what I mean? It, go, it goes on and on and on. Right. So I encourage soft rhyme to give you briefly some rhyme schemes um, that we can use. Um, we have, now when I say a letter, A, B, A, B means da 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 A, da 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 fine, da 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 way, da 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 kind. You see, the first and the third rhyme, and the second and the fourth rhyme. So that's A, B, A, B, right? So now knowing that, let's go over the kinds of rhyme schemes you can do. On two-line rhyme scheme, you can do X, A, X, A, which means the first and third don't rhyme. X means no rhyme. That kind of rhyme scheme is great for telling stories because with storytelling, you're going to use more details and less emotion. And you want those details to be unique, right? So this, only, this allows you only one rhyme, you only have to rhyme the second and the fourth, which is one rhyme. In all those four lines, you only have to rhyme twice. You rhyme the, the, the second and the fourth line. So you've got room now on the first and third not to rhyme. So you can just throw in the details that you hear in your head without worrying about rhyme. And that's nice. So XA, XA is really nice for storytelling. Uh, then we go AB, AB. That's nice. Also, there's A, A, B, B. Notice now that the rhymes are happening faster. A, A, B, B. It's not A, B, A, B. So it's not the first and fourth, first and third. It's first and second. So they're getting tighter. And what that does is that creates more tension. So you'll notice that a lot of songs today do the A, A, B, B, sometimes C, C, and D, D. They tighten the rhyme closer because it creates more angst. And you can even go A, 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 which is unexpected because when, the, when you go A, A, they expect now a new one, B, B. But you keep going A, 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 and in hip hop, they'll go A, 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 so that that's, creates massive amounts of tension, right? Uh, and last, we have XXAA, which is the first two lines don't rhyme with the last two, but the last two do rhyme. So da 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 way da 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 fine da 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 go da 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 blow. That's called unbalanced rhyme, right? It sounds kind of kooky, but the last line in the, in the section did rhyme. It rhymed with the, the line before it. So that's a little trick for you all to have. Now my time is up, and I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little tete-a-tete that we've had today. Hmm? So keep it on the double nickel, and I'll see you on the flip-flop. Adios, amigos, and enjoy your day. There in to Chicago. This program started basically because after my injuries in war, I didn't know how to deal with myself. I came back, had a brain injury, my best friend was shot killed. I didn't know myself at that point. Art has helped me by giving me a chance to have a voice again. I used to not be able to leave my house. I couldn't go talk to people. I would physically throw up and get sick. If you could be 0% that's committing suicide, 100% being the best you can be. After the Marine Corps, after being injured, I was at probably like a nine or a 10. And after this school, I was back to like 85% me. For people who may struggle like I did and didn't want to break out of the house and be like, I'm not sure if this is going to work, 
I just want them to know my story out here and learn with other combat vets how to do art and if they're looking for one more way, if they just come out here and give me a chance, it's going to be worth it. What we were aiming for is to express what we were dealing with, you know, when we were deployed and during our military career, where we literally get out of our element, go on this kind of like alternate reality to go back in time, think about what we went through and express it to other people. Just being exposed to different concepts of art, like at the museum and some of the contemporary art we saw, um, that's what influenced me to try doing a performance piece for my last project. The opportunity to be at the school was just phenomenal. It was amazing. We could, at lunch, we could go and wander the halls of the museums and that was, that was pretty awesome. I think the hardest part was actually talking about what I've been through with it was easy talking to Richard because he is a combat veteran and he has been through stuff I've been through. And My job was to you know, go find IEDs or find landmines or anti-personnel landmines and take them apart. And little did I know, I was putting that stuff inside me. At first it's a little hard to let yourself become vulnerable. Um, you won't really know what to do right away. It takes a couple days. I know for me it took a week. Being surrounded by a bunch of veterans that like know what combat feels like, knows the after effects of combat, knows how it feels to come home. It was really comfortable being here. They're gonna come to class like normal college students, treated like normal people, that know how to be like, I can be in college, I am a normal person, and I could live like everybody else lives. If even one of them chose to go to college and study art and has that artist brain to where it saved them, it's totally worth it. Internet, internet world, welcome back. I just messed up my whole thing here. I was, do, it took me four hours to get this straight and now I messed it up in the first 20 seconds. Um, hello internet, Jason Myers uh, here again. Was, uh, if uh, there's anybody in here, I see people. It's starting and I hope uh, more folks tune in and uh, we uh, don't bore you so much or too much considering uh, what we're going to do is a lot of talking today, um, but, but going through my printed portfolios and showing work that I bring with me and showcase um, when I'm trying to get work from ad agencies and uh, magazines and brands and um, any type of creative division or department or company that hires uh, photographers and directors. Um, this is my printed portfolio. Um, I have two of them and I'm going to go through and, and just kind of show some of the images and, and showcase how it flows and the reasons why I have it set up this particular way. Um, I, I have two portfolios um, and, and go, just a little flashback to when I was first getting started and often a lot of people ask me how do I get the work that I get. I see someone's butt over here. Right. Brett's butt. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the first question I get is, like, how do you get your jobs? And I, there's no real finite answer on that because a lot of it's word of mouth, a lot of it is happenstance, a lot of it's just accidental, a lot of it's the internet, a lot of it can be me hustling, getting on a plane, going to New York or LA or Chicago or even in my local market here in Nashville. And, and showing my work and, and hopefully something resonates with those clients and they give me an opportunity to bid on a job or have a, an opportunity to, uh, to work with them. So um, when I first started, the first portfolio I had, I say portfolio, was, was my website. And, and it still is, it is the easiest way for people to find you um, and if it uh, has search engine optimization, SEO built into it, which a lot of them do now, and keywords and all of those things that go into making um, your website be easily searchable and um, when people are looking for specific things. Um, 
you know, that is, that is what I would say is the, the most important, is having a good uh, SEO-rich website that um, if someone is in New Mexico and they need to find a photographer in Des Moines, Iowa, that they find you by typing in Des Moines, Iowa lifestyle photographer or Des Moines, Iowa um, sports photographer or wedding photographer or whatever it may be because a lot of the jobs that we get and while I do work a lot locally a lot of the jobs that I get are from other places they they are either created and crafted in in major cities around the world and they just happen to be shooting in Nashville um, or they like my work and want to send me somewhere else but they are um, you know searching a specific um, a specific style and they're trying to find you so having a good website is critical um, that said what we're gonna be talking about today is really about my printed portfolios because at the end of the day as a photographer it is very fulfilling to see your work printed and we don't often see a lot of that anymore um, most of what I shoot goes straight to digital or it's on Instagram or it's on a website um, or you know so when, when I see my own work printed in the wild on a billboard or on a, on, in, a in an advertising campaign in a magazine I mean that's that's pretty fun uh, when you go to a newsstand and you open up a magazine and you see the work that you shot the problem is is we don't I, I mean a lot of the time there's so many magazines I and it happens the cycles only a month um, typically for these that I, I miss them I don't get to see my work printed so um, I started um, with uh, my own printed portfolios through um, I think it was HP MagCloud I don't even know if they're even a thing anymore they were part of the HP brand like copiers and they would do like spiral bound um, books if you will and that was my first my first printed book and it, it was it was rudimentary and it was there was nothing fancy about it um, and they were fairly inexpensive and that was the first thing I would take to meetings and explain hey look I'm really just haven't invested in a in a in a true portfolio yet but I mean honestly it was a it was a very good easy way to start and there are other services out there that do this I think Adorama Picks and uh, Miller's and um, uh, I know Agency Access uh, is a is a company that does uh, portfolio printing and in fact they did one for me a few years ago but I wanted to take um, I wanted to take it uh, I wanted to I wanted to start printing my own work and, and having the ability to I, I'm using my hands over here um, to start printing my own work and be able to s switch pages and swap things around the way I wanted to so uh, we're gonna go through my books and if you have questions please type them out um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the uh, the images the the printing the um, the shoots and that's part of the fun of, of looking at it with me or with the person who photographed it in a portfolio meeting um, where I might be sitting across from art buyers or, or editors or other creatives and, and I can tell the stories of the images I can can explain what the job was and, and, and why they, um, you know, what it was like on set with uh, some of these folks. So um, uh, before I get too, too deep into the books, um, uh, today we are, um, and I don't know how to explain the this, big it's called the big payback today. Richard's over, over here, I don't know, somewhere over here. And there's a lot of things going on with, um, with matching through these streams and you know the, the the part is is you know if you can donate anything at all even if it's a dollar five dollars ten dollars it helps pay for the 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 programs that creative vets puts on and in, in helping uh, veterans uh, learn art and um, and thrive through the the, the art process so um, a lot of what is being donated uh, can be matched and there are times when it can be exponential um, today at 3:30 Central. Um, there is a matching opportunity. Whoever um, gets closest to 3:30 with a donation, it could be matched uh, exponentially. 
in, in fact, we'll uh, win a thousand bucks. We will win a thousand dollars if somebody makes a donation. Um, closest to three thirty. Closest to three thirty, and, and the denomination is not important. But um, you know, ten. Ten minimum, $10. minimum ten dollars. Yeah. I guess it is. There are rules to this. Um, we are learning this. There's no as rules. We, There's no no rules, rules, but the rules are this. Uh, it's kind of like what's going on in the world right now. Um, so, anyways, um, and also please share this link. Um, I know even if it, it may not be um, something that after I stop talking, you you uh, you know you might think this isn't. I'm kind of tired of looking at pictures. There may be other people that um, are aspiring photographers or people who are working photographers that could get something out of this um, or even just enjoying the stories of some of the behind the scenes moments that we had. So please share, please donate if you can. Um, there should be a link somewhere in there. I'm guessing there's a thing here somewhere. Um, and uh, we are gonna be, uh, for people that donate, is this correct? Yeah, anybody that donates is into a drawing. Anybody that donates today will be entered into a drawing. I have. Well, while you're online. While so you're can, online. No, while you're online. While I'm online. See again, we're just we're learning as we go. Um, and I brought a bunch of 11 by 14 prints um, that I will be, uh, we will be showing and uh, giving out. So these are things that I shot and printed myself. And, uh, and did they get a pick, the winner? I mean, that's up to you guys. I don't care um, how this gets done. I, I mean, some people may want this image, some people will want a different image. So, yeah. so I'm gonna let the the big brains here in the studio figure all that out. But, um, but we'll have some some prints to give away to people who donate during the stream today. So, please donate. Oh, I'm losing people. Come on, y'all. I knew it. I gotta start giving money. I gotta start just giving money back. Uh, to encourage some engagement, but uh, but please share, please please uh, feel free to type a question or a message, and we're going to get started here. So, anyways, a little bit about these books. They are 11 by 17, um, or they're a little bit bigger than that because you know obviously I have 11 by 17 landscape style images in here, and this portfolio is custom made. Um, I don't know if you can see it here. We're going to try, but it's custom made and I have two of them and the other is a white with the red lettering and it's a different book and part of why I have two different books is as a portrait photographer um, I need my work to flow I need there to be a, a concise and, and clear message on um, the type of work that I am going to um, to to be shooting if, if someone comes to me and doesn't have faith that I can produce what they are expecting then they're not going to hire me. So I have two books because I want to keep the message clear that this is my my portrait book, and then I have another. I'm sorry, I'm leaning over here that I will show you. That is my lifestyle book, uh, and I say lifestyle, and it's more advertising, lifestyle, music culture, um, and um, and sports really. So we'll we'll show you both books, but. Um, but we'll start with the portraits and Scott Mullenberg, um, who is in Maine, um, he has a company, it's, these are all hand, handmade, they are not inexpensive, but in the grand scheme of the jobs that I'm trying to get, this investment, when you sit down with somebody and you open this up and they go, oh wow, this is a nice, well-made book, um, when you're standing next to a thousand other people trying to get someone's attention, Things like this make it make you make you stand out. And um, I can swap in if you see there's the screw posts. And the paper that I use is already pre-drilled, so you, the the paper has holes in it, and it's pre-scored. Um, and all I have to do is make sure my settings and my printer is done well um, at the studio, so I can print my own work, and then I can switch pages out and just drop them in and take them out of this this book so um, this is about my fourth portfolio with Scott um, through different branding changes and different color schemes and um, it every time he's a he's a pleasure to work with and he does an amazing job so anyway it's getting started so uh, this is a uh, frame from a shoot with 
uh, Claire Bowen, who is an amazing actress and musician. She uh, she was on the TV show Nashville uh, for seven or eight seasons, six or eight seasons, I can't remember. And um, we've been friends for a few years, and this past year, she, we finally were linked up and said, come by the studio and let's just shoot something for fun. And this is uh, the result of a test shoot that we had in the studio and uh, has become one of my favorite shoots. Just uh, as, a, as a person and a performer, she. She gives you a, a thousand percent, and it's uh, a lot of fun to work with entertainers who um, are are are, wor are working with you. And, and uh, uh, it's a little different working with entertainers as it is with athletes, as it is with normal business people. And um, each one has its own set of challenges, but uh, and advantages. So um, here are my friends, Kel uh, Kelsey Kulik on the left. I don't know if you can see that. There she is. She was actually in the chat a little bit ago. Kelsey was in the chat a little bit ago, so maybe she's watching now. Um, and this is a shoot from a, about a year or two ago, and this was to get um, some of her music content going. Um, this is uh, country artist uh, Justin Moore, and this was shot in um, in Arkansas. And, and literally, this was I had to set up a canvas in this space that we were at. We, had, we were on 600 acres, and... There was, there was no structure. There was one little building that had been knocked down years and years ago, so there was nothing for me to put him up against. And uh, I brought this painted canvas and literally just set it up in front of a lake, and we made this frame. In fact, a lot of what he, he has used in his most recent album was shot, was shot uh, five, five years ago. So it's kind of funny how some things continue to have, uh, you know, have use. So um, this is Sean Booth. He is a, um, he was on The Bachelorette, but this was a, um, a, sh a shoot with him for a magazine uh, called uh, what was the magazine? Um, they all start to blend together. I apologize. Uh, triathlete, uh, triathlete magazine, and this was a cover. We ended up, I think, using a different frame of this, but uh, this was a cover image for Triathlete magazine. Um, he lives here in Nashville and uh, has a, a workout center here. Um, Serena Williams, and this was part of a Delta campaign. Uh, I was shooting, I was shooting um, kind of behind the scenes this day, and um, editors for Delta Sky Miles magazine, uh, they were doing a commercial, and Delta Sky Miles magazine, I think it's in the sky now, uh, they asked me if I could grab a portrait of Serena. Well, as opposed to the behind the scenes stuff that we were getting and I had six frames and this was uh, an image that I got out of those six frames so uh, the, in fact the, uh, the, the original image is a vertical um, portrait image but I cropped it to make it fit this book um, got uh, some things I did with the WWE a couple years ago and uh, over in Memphis and uh, Rey Mysterio and we have um, a portrait that was shot under the stadium um, in Tampa, the, um, the minor, or I guess it's the uh, spring training stadium for the Yankees. And this was Mariana Rivera for JBL headphones. And um, literally it was uh, one light on a white seamless and shot under a stadium. And it uh, looks like it was shot in the studio, but we shot this in the elements. So, um, one of my favorites too, Mr. Two. Um, just a lot of a lot of uh, memories from that that week and that shoot, and it kind of was one of the, the shoots that got my career going. Um, this is a personal test shoot down in Florida. This was probably 2013, and uh, as much uh, many athletes as I was shooting back in the day, that I just I didn't have a lot of females in my portfolio and. I can't remember this girl's name, but she was uh, one of the the players on the Palm Beach Atlantic soccer team. And I, again, I set my canvas up right in front of the goal, and we just uh, we just had fun. Um, and talk about you know how the uh, you know portraits or images are used. Uh, this is um, the band Perry, and this was shot during a. Um, they were doing some commercials, and this was a campaign 
uh, by a ad agency out of Dallas, and this was a advertising campaign for Pizza Hut. I mean, you wouldn't know that looking at this, but this was a, an advertising campaign for Pizza Hut, and it was to be done for military bases in Japan and uh, Asia, um, U.S. military bases, and they were having a Pizza Hut advertising campaign specifically targeted to uh, the military in those regions. So we, we shot this, uh, and this was one of the outtakes from that campaign. So, you know, as a portrait photographer, you know, our, the uses of our images are so, can be so varied that you don't realize that some can be used for, um, you know, things like this. Uh, again, Pizza Hut. Um, we have Jason Aldean, Kelsey Ballerini. Uh, this was shot uh, a couple of years ago, right before ACM Honors here in Nashville, they had a song, or, or I believe Kelsey had a, they were, uh, they, they had a song together on Jason's new album and at the time, and they weren't sure if it was going to be a single or not, so they asked me to get a shot of the two of them together, and this was done right before um, the ACM Honors Awards at the Ryman, so they they had uh, uh, they had them all glammed up and ready to go. I, I I I threw them up against a big light source, and that was one of the results. So uh, this is Eric Etheridge, uh, another friend of mine, a musician and a Canadian country singer. We had this done a couple years ago, or about a year and a half ago. Jana Kramer and Craig Campbell artists and uh, Dancing with the Stars and you're an actress and then we have um, but you know in, in, in going through your portfolio you want it to flow I mean my goal here is to kind of keep the flow going with colors and tones and um, so then we we go from that into kind of these darker moodier looks. Uh, this is one of the veterans over here I threw, that went through the songwriting program, came to the studio. And uh, you can see how we went from this, these, these darker tones and we get into a little bit of color from here to here. Um, and having different, you know, just playing with, playing with the, uh, the camera and then using it to showcase what you're able to do. Again, a lot of color and pop and, um, you know, just a little different than where we were just a couple of, of pages ago. And that's the hardest part is picking the images for your portfolio when you've shot so many frames of which are the strongest, uh, which is why I, I always suggest getting and hiring a, a consultant to help you go through your work and pick the strongest images. These two books have quite a few images in them and uh, you know, I, there's two schools of thought on that, that you can be very precise and have a, a narrow amount of images because you want people to see your best work. It's hard to step away and not think that you have your best work every time you're showing it. Um, and then another school of thought is, and this was uh, told to me by a photographer friend, um, and she has, her portfolio, she probably has five of them that are two or three inches thick. And her thought process is if I get to, as hard as it is to get a meeting with these decision makers, I don't want them to flip through my book in 30 seconds and then be done. She wants to keep them flipping through her book so she has an opportunity to show more work, which if this isn't doing it for them, then maybe something in one of the other books or later down the road is. And, uh, and that's why it's, it's really encouraged uh, to get another set of eyes to look at your work and determine what's your best work. And, um, I, I can't strongly uh, recommend it more. So anyways, we're gonna keep moving, but uh, this was down in Muscle Shoals, with just uh, some musicians that were playing and threw them outside against the door and said, stay there, let me take your picture. Uh, Luke Combs at the Ryman. This was, uh, I believe, night two of his two night uh, sold out shows a couple years ago, right before he literally took over the country music world. And uh, those two shows were pretty fantastic, getting to be there with him and, and seeing that energy um, and seeing his growth over the last four years, five years here in Nashville and seeing where he's at now. So 
uh, just kind of a fun memory and fun moment right behind the curtains at the Grand Ole, or at the uh, at the Ryman Auditorium. And again, going from here to some black and white frames, uh, just to mix it up a little bit and, and, and change it because you, as much as you want it to flow, you also need to show some range uh, without deviating too much from what the core of, of what you're trying to show is. So I uh, try to do that, leave a little space. Um, Travis Denning, this was one of my favorite frames from the shoot. And uh, they used a similar frame, but Travis is now, I think, has a top, I know he has a top five single right now, which uh, some of this artwork was used for, and uh, hoping he gets it to number one. Uh, again, playing with light, trying something a little weird. Uh, this is Kenton Bryant in the studio, and, uh, you know, we were just playing and just trying to make some, make some weird things. I like this frame, so I put it in my book. Uh, are there any questions out there? Uh, I see that there's some folks watching, and I will just talk and turn, turn and burn. But uh, any questions about the portfolio, the process, um, you know, any of these images? If you want to know uh, what the weather was like uh, during these shoots, I can tell you because that's one of the weird things I can recall is uh, the day. And I think that's part of what makes photography fun for me is the memories that I have from the shoots. Uh, I don't have a lot of memories. Uh, from growing up and as a kid I, the memories I have are typically from the photos that, that my parents uh, took growing up so it's um, it's it's fun to relive those through this and uh, you know the, the time of year and the the terrible jokes that I probably made I got a taco I don't know I got some yeah, uh, some kind of never, I got a taco sparks. hey sparks um, or whatever spark is I don't know. Um, how do you know what mood best complements the person you are photographing? That's a fantastic question, um, and it's a hard question uh, to answer, um, or it's a hard question to figure out. And you know, I shoot a lot of different people, and it a lot of the times, um, you know, the 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 mood or the the feel comes from the creative director or the uh, or the art director and saying, hey, look, here, here are, here's where we want to go with this. Here are some visual references and we'll have a mood board or we'll put something together and we'll, then they'll share it to us as the, the creative team. And, you know, I, sometimes there's a lot of direction and they have a very specific goal and what kind of mood, whether it's serious or dark and moody or really poppy and bright or outside on, or, or at an environment or in the studio. And then sometimes it's, you you have to figure that out on your own, um, which is a lot of the time with your magazine uh, jobs because the the photo editor can't be on set or they can't be they can't fly down and be there with you unless it's a really big client and a really big story. So you have to try to figure out who your subject is and create an environment that matches who they are and or what you want them to be. Sometimes. Like these two images here, uh, you know, with Joe and Stormy Warren. Stormy is on Sirius XM The Highway. You probably have heard him talking, but probably many people don't see what he looks like unless you follow him on Instagram. They're both funny guys, and they're, they're, they were getting ready to do this, this um, event together, and I wanted to make sure that they had some humor in, involved. So, I mean, I knew I could joke around with them, and I knew they were going to be joking around, and, you know, sometimes you just capture a nice frame. Um, this is Charlie and Andy Nelson, um, who own Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery, and I just felt like, you know, everybody had shot them in front of the, the, the bourbon barrel, the whiskey barrels, and I just wanted to separate them a little bit from it in their barrel warehouse. So we, we just, we just kind of winged it. Um, but, you know, you, you also want to be cognizant of who you're shooting. I'm not going to shoot a, you know, billionaire the same way. Who's, who's very serious and takes themselves very seriously uh, the way I would shoot maybe uh, a, a, a comedian uh, because they're going to want to play around they're going to they're going to they're going to be more playful you know the typically the, the same thing gets told to me every shoot just make me look cool man um, make me look good and I hear that a lot and and in fact that guy told me that who was a billionaire um, 
and I've, I've photographed, I think, five billionaires over the years who uh, typically for Forbes. And uh, the guy said to me, just make me look good. And I was like, well, that, that's going to cost you extra. And he looked right at me like deadpan and said, I'm good for it. And I realized you just never bluff a billionaire because you're not going to win uh, when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to talking about money. But he was a nice guy, but he was, he was kind of being, he was joking too. So um, you have to look at the environment. You have to look around you. You have to see what your, 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 um, your goals, I mean, truly knowing what your goals are. And then when you get there, you have to pivot. You have to, if something's not working, you have to figure it out. And uh, I was on a shoot, I had a shoot yesterday up in Kentucky. And the artist that I was working with um, had picked an amazing location. It was his old high school, middle school, elementary school, or K through 12 school that was built in the 20s. And there was so much grit and history in this place that everywhere we walked around it outside and everywhere we went inside, there was a story to tell. So I really didn't have to do much. I just had to get them in the right spot and use the environment to help me tell their story. So. Uh, that was a great question, and, and it's one that I, you, you have to go and answer every, on every photo shoot. Um, but again, planning, getting direction from your subject and your or, and, and or your editor or your art director, um, you know that is uh, that helps too. That gets you. I, I'm more of an execution style photographer versus a creative photographer. Uh, some people are just totally creative, and they've got a vision, and they have that. You know, I, I, don't, I, I don't have that all the time. And sometimes I don't know it until I get on set. Um, so sometimes for me, uh, getting a starting point and then, and then going is, is the easiest way for me to, to, to go. So um, going through here again, we're getting a little darker and moodier. Uh, this is Aubrey People. She was also on the TV show Nashville. But uh, and this was the first time I met her and we were shooting in this really cool space and uh, she was super sweet, very nice, and I, she wanted to get on this this piece of, it was just sitting there, it was a credenza or a something, and somebody had painted flawed on there, and I said, you sure you don't want me to take that off? She goes, no, 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 I totally love that. And uh, sh she's an actress, so again, totally different than maybe your, you know, 60-year-old CEO who is straight up you know, buttoned up and just wants a, a strong, you know, headshot. Um, she was willing to push the envelope on, on how she was presented, and I love that. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is a, a good story. This is uh, BJ the Chicago Kid, and I was shooting uh, some, some music events for Red Bull, and this, uh, this guy's a rapper and musician and songwriter and was playing at a location here in Nashville. And I, I usually shoot portraits of the artists before they go on, before I lose their attention and they go get sweaty and then they come back to me and they say, oh man, I wish I just, I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't look good. Uh, so this guy did kind of the same thing. He didn't want to do it beforehand. He wanted to do it after the show. So I, I really had started to lose hope that I would get a portrait. And I saw that this is a, this is a freight elevator in the, in Cannery, um, in, Henry Ballroom area here in Nashville and the manager and everybody's like oh just let's just take this down down here and we'll just do it and we'll get it done with well I wanted to shoot it here I wanted to shoot it in this space and I just felt like this was a cool space to do it in and when I when I went down to at that point I felt like I had lost the ability to shoot it here because the management and the, the handlers and everybody was were getting involved and then I went down and, and said hello met met him and he said well yeah let's just do it here and I said he goes unless you have another place in mind and when he gave me that window I took it I said you know I'll be honest with you I really think there's a place upstairs that would look a lot better than this down here and he said to me he's like man I trust you you're you're an artist you, you know what works best and sometimes that doesn't happen sometimes it does and all we had to do is walk up a flight of stairs and this was here and and I got this frame and I like it some people you know, it doesn't do anything for him, but I just, I like the fact that he said yes to me and let me uh, try to make it better than being in a dark, uninteresting area. So, um, again, sometimes one light in a, in a backstage 
before a show, it can, you know, can be all you need. And uh, sometimes impromptu shoots. This was uh, I was helping uh, my friend Ward, who runs um, an amazing twice a week uh, music event here in Nashville called Whiskey Jam. Uh, he is on doing live stream or doing Instagram live Mondays and Thursdays uh, at nine o'clock central. And uh, now during the the fact that all the bars and restaurants are shut down, but this was a guy who was playing on a record um, that they recorded kind of live. It was kind of a live record that uh, Whiskey Jam made with some amazingly talented musicians. And this guy's name is King Corduroy. And this is what he looks like. And uh, I just had to take his portrait while I was there kind of uh, documenting the, the day. So again, take advantage of the opportunities that you have. Again, another shot of Jana. Um, just like the shot. Um, again, colors, the pinks in here, and the pinks and purples in here, and all of this. I just, you know, try to match up images that flow. Uh, Ghostface Killa from uh, Wu Tang Clan. Again, this was another Red Bull show, and I did not think I was going to get this, get a frame of him other than the show. And he promised me beforehand he would stop and take a picture. And what you can't see right over here. Like just over here is the door where it leads out. And he was walking through after the show and he had 30 people with him. And I was like, Mr. Killa, you said you'd let me take your portrait and I need to get a portrait of you. And he said, all right, man. He goes, just call me Ghost. I'm like, Mr. Ghost. He goes, all right, funny guy. So um, anyways, he just literally sat down on this couch that was in the green room right outside the door. And if over here, there were 30 people trying to push him out the door and get him to his bus. And I got him to sit for literally 15 seconds and grabbed 20 frames and just fire and fire and fire. But I had a light set up and I, I kind of made it like you had to come to me and I had the, the, the light there. So it was kind of eh, make him feel obligated a little bit because he did tell me he was going to stop for me. So uh, this is actually the same green room, but uh, different artist. Um, here's my fr hey, handsome friend, Jackie Lee. I miss my friend, Jackie Lee. I don't, I haven't, Seen him posting much. I don't know what he's been doing lately. Uh, another artist, uh, Josh Phillips, shot here in Nashville. Um, this was a, a, a portrait that I took of, uh, I don't even know if he's wrestling anymore. He was a WWE wrestler named Brad Maddox. And this was for College of Charleston magazine. He went to the College of Charleston and uh, they were really instrumental in, in my early career by giving me some really amazing, um, amazing opportunities to shoot some of their alumni that just happened to either live in Florida or wherever I was going and the, the uh, they were always very smart about I mean they invested in their creative they had a very specific plan they they knew what they wanted and uh, gave me the tools and the budgets to, to produce it but this was just an act, kind of an outtake it never got uh, used but just a just a nice moment uh, same same here just a backstage moment I don't even know what this guy's name is. I can't remember his name, but I think he plays with Drake White or used to. Um, and uh, sat down in front of my camera and took his took a picture. Um, Holly Williams outside of her store here in Nashville called White's Mercantile. Again, I think everybody shoots the same things. I like to pull back and show a little bit of a little bit of the, the environment. And uh, we shot that for a story for. Be honest, I forgot. It's either Worth Magazine or Southern Living. I can't remember which which it was. Um, again, same concept here with Craig, Craig Campbell. You know, we were out on a farm shooting content for a single he released a few years ago, and I said, "Let's set the canvas up. Let's just, you know, give it give it some, you know, like we did it on purpose." And I love, and they're actually sitting on the same stool, which is kind of funny. Um, but again, sometimes you just you, you shoot a wide shot and then you come in closer and try to tell the story a little tighter um, by, you know, coming in and really getting into people's eyes. Oh, look who it is. It's it's Mr. Handsome, Richard Casper. I forget. He's right over here. So, uh, yeah, he, some of his, uh, his his glamour shots. Ooh, someone said, ooh. Yeah, so I know. I, I have more shots of Richard than I know what to do with, to be honest with you. And this, I think this is the first time 
a veteran came by the studio. Yeah, he was the very first one Ryan met to. Yeah, okay, and, uh, and then he, so this has been now a couple years ago. Richard's hair's better now. That was the worst. That is a bad haircut. And that was Richard. my great clips day. Yeah. I was like, yeah, crap. You know who's missing out in this whole coronavirus thing is, is like great clips or, because, I mean, they should get user submitted uh, bad haircuts and, yeah. and make an ad campaign. It's like we're still here. We're gonna we'll, we're gonna fix we're gonna fix you. I don't know why they haven't had that. Like all the bad haircuts would be hilarious. Um, again, but this is uh, you know this is kind of what started not the relationship but uh, the concept of photographing the veterans uh, that are that go through the Creative Vets program when they come to Nashville. So uh, again, kind of one of these weird what is going on kind of stories. This was Joe, Joe Denham. He wanted to come out of a let lady's bathroom wearing a tuxedo with a cocktail with a flamingo. Okay, let's do it. Um, country legend and superstar James Travis Dawes. Uh, if anybody, you know, if you haven't heard of James Travis Dawes, well, then I don't know what rock you're living under. And uh, again, then some backstage portraits and trying to make things, I'm moving this thing all over the place. Make this fun and poppy. Uh, my friend Joey Hyde and Maggie Rose. Um, you know, so it's yeah, just have fun and keep themes together. Um, did I, have I missed any questions? By the way, um, just to remind everybody, in 15 minutes, um, if we, if anybody has an opportunity or has a desire to donate uh, even ten dollars to Creative Vets, uh, there will be an opportunity for Creative Vets to win a matching. Um, or Just to win, win to win a thousand dollars to whomever, uh, or closest to three. I don't know. There's all kinds of rules. But anyways, if you can donate at least ten dollars at three thirty Central Time, I guess four thirty Eastern, um, and uh, as close to three thirty as you can, and they will potentially win a thousand dollars for programs. So. Um, and again, I know. That was point zero six seconds off from the last one. And he was, still didn't win. Point zero. So, anyways, so let's let's hack this thing. If there are ten of you in this chat, twelve of you or twenty, I can't. I don't know what number I'm supposed to be looking at here. If everybody can go at three twenty nine, get it all set up, and make a ten dollar donation at three thirty, there's a chance that Creative Vets might be able to turn your ten dollars into a thousand. So uh, think about it that way. It's it's like uh, playing the stock market. Only you can't really lose. You, given to a good cause and your return on investment is donated to uh, to a great cause so um, and look we have oh look who it is I hope he's tuned in here today is Sean in the stream today uh, I've got a I've got him in my portfolio he was on the, the stream on Tuesday and we did a review of some of his work and um, again you know I don't put images in my portfolio that don't mean something to me and this day um, both of these guys came in. In fact, there were a few more, but these were two of the, the, the Creative Vets veterans uh, who have been through either the art program or the songwriting program. And I, I loved that day. And the reason I, I have them in there is, again, the personalities, the colors, and, and the, the memory of the day. So uh, thank you to them for coming by. And uh, we can now say Sean's pink mohawk is famous to the world. Um, so that was book one, um, and you know you always want to make sure people can find you, and uh, you know you always have your website or your Instagram or phone number so that they can hire you. But uh, that was the portrait book, and we will switch over to the um, uh, the lifestyle book, which is a little thicker, and I'll probably go a little faster through this uh, just to, so I don't bore you. But uh, the reason, again, if you're just tuning in, the reason I, I have two portfolios uh, is so that I, I never really know who I'm meeting with. I, I might think I do. Uh, like, I probably won't show this book to managers here in Nashville who want to hire me to have their, uh, their artists photograph because this is a bit more commercial. Uh, there is some music in here, but it's it's not really artist driven. It's not portrait driven. It's it's more of the music culture and the vibe, whereas the other book is what's more traditionally used for album art or press kits or press press materials, 
And this is who I would show this book probably more to advertising agencies and possibly magazines uh, or, or brands or companies who want to help tell their story um, in a lifestyle capacity or in a, um, you know, kind of a vibe versus just portraits of people. So that's why I have two books. And sometimes if I'm not getting the vibe from somebody, I will take it out of their hands and I'll throw them the other book because you, you know, you truly only have a limited amount of time to, to get people's attention and you don't want to lose them. And if they don't, sometimes, and unfortunately, what will happen is if they don't see something on your website or they don't see something, oh, this is not, push this back, um, or they won't, or they don't see it in your portfolio, they think you can't shoot it, which makes it really hard to stay on task and on genre, you know, when you're presenting your work. And that's the, the two things I, I hate hearing are one, I didn't think I could afford you, which is a terrible, terrible thing to hear when I have, when it's a friend, especially they think, oh, I didn't know if I could afford you. Well, call me, ask me, let's talk about it. Let's figure out a way to make it work. And a lot of the times they can't afford me. They just don't know what they need. And I can scale the shoot and scale the budget to give them what they expect without um, breaking the bank. And then the other thing is, I didn't know you did that kind of work. Again, it happens to me often. And it's, it's a shame because I feel like a lot of the people that say that to me are people who follow me on Instagram or follow me or, or, or know my work or, or know me personally. But for whatever reason, what they need, it does, they don't see in your portfolio when I've been shooting for a decade now and have shot millions of frames for thousands of clients and I don't show everything. I, there's no possible way for me to show everything that I've shot through the years and, and, and it not lose um, someone's attention or, or have it uh, muddy the water and what people think I um, am able to do. So, so which is why I have to be very precise and careful and it's hard it's a real hard thing to pick your favorite child right so you have to uh, you have to try to do it um, you know the best way you can and this, for me it's having two books so this was a test shoot I did a, a couple of Novembers ago and and, and and part of the reason if you if you were been paying attention for the last little bit you'll know that the last book that I showed was very portrait driven very precise very singular this is more lifestyle and I was losing a lot of bids because they would call me, um, ad agency would call me and say, hey, we love your work. Do you have any lifestyle images? Well, I did, but maybe nothing truly relevant for what they kept asking me for. And a lot of brands, I mean, if you imagine this could be the Carhartt or Levi's or whatever it is, a boot company or a eyeglass company, or anything that's in that, or um, I don't know, a, a retail store, I didn't have a lot of this kind of imagery in my portfolio, so they couldn't look past the fact that I had images in my portfolio or that, 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 or that I could do the work that they needed done. So I had to create, I had to create this environment. So I, I, I got a stylist and a hair and makeup person and some models and some props and a prop stylist and assistants and I went and shot a campaign basically to show that this could be anything. This could be an ad for, uh, I mean, it could be a bank that says, are you tired of staying inside? We're gonna finance your new camper van. I don't know, I'm making all this up as I go, but that was the vibe. Um, we wanna do a camping, light outdoor kind of kind of scenario. So I mean, and by, this is a thermos, uh, you know, it could be a thermos campaign or this ax company back here or the tent company or the guitar uh, manufacturer so you, you know this is where lifestyle gets a little blurry because people truly don't everybody's interpretation of it is different um, where one person says lifestyle they think it's one thing and I had a job and I think it's in this book with Hertz rental cars and they kept saying lifestyle I thought they meant something like this and I'll show you when we get there what they meant but uh, but yeah it's more of an environment more of a you know you want to implement you know it, like put yourself in this scenario um, to sell a product like maybe it's Coleman maybe it's this old Coleman cooler maybe it's this you know trout net or this vehicle in the background and uh, you know you want to try to you know for people that want to sell the sell a product or, or create an environment uh, or tell a story 
you know, this is what I would consider more lifestyle. So again, same thing here, no people, but there's something happening here. They're roasting some marshmallow, I think. Oh, yeah, marshmallows. Um, but then I focused on the cooler, which could, which could be a Coleman ad. So uh, same thing here. Uh, again, this is uh, Chase Rice's apparel brand called Head Down, Eyes Up. And it took a while to, to, to put this shoot together, but trying to you know, do more of a lookbook lifestyle type thing. So instead of just a, a shirt on a body, you know, we, we got models and we created little environments and we branded the mess out of them so that there was no confusion what brand was being advertised here um, so that people could see the products on people so that they, they could then see it on them and then they could hire or they could buy that product. Um, same thing here, again, this is from the same shoot, so just a hoodie and uh, we just created now, this was shot at Grimey's Record Store over here in Nashville. Um, this is not part of that shoot, but again, in talking about trying to get things to flow, you know, I went from there to here. Um, just a fun moment to, because you know, there's a car in it, I thought, well, let's, let's keep it flowing. Um, and for the average person, they're not going to know a lot of these shoots were done on the same day or the same people. I mean, I remember one of my portfolios, I had the same person in it four times, and the person who pulled the images for me and helped me pick it did not realize they were the same person. So what we think is, you know, because we're so close to it, we know, we, we try to make it as unique and different, but sometimes having it in there, uh, having multiple images of the same person is not a bad thing. So it's, you know, a little subjective, but again, US Polo, um, when I was in South Florida, when I lived in West Palm, I shot a ton of polo, a lot of action sports, did work with the Dolphins and, um, you know, but, but polo was a thing I shot probably every Sunday for five years. And this was the best polo in the world uh, in, at that time of the year. And I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so I have an archive of, of polo. Um, this is here in Nashville. This is uh, during the Iroquois steeplechase, probably 2013. I literally did not know that this was happening, and someone pointed, and I turned around, and I saw this happening, and I just turned around and grabbed a frame. And my, 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 I tell this all the time, like, the fallback for me is if I don't see, like, anyone's enjoying my portfolio at all, I'll just quickly skip to the, the doggies here, because everyone likes puppies and I I win so um, sorry about my, my elbow coming through the frame but again this was uh, some polo but this was actually for uh, Four Seasons magazine and they were selling uh, it was an advertorial or something about um, polo lessons or something in Palm Beach County so we were up at the up before dawn and uh, and we're shooting some polo images. I just like this one the best. And uh, 327. We're 327. Yeah, we're getting close. To, you have to put in a lot of information too if you're a first time donor. Yeah, you have to put in a lot of information. So if you do, if you're thinking of donating anything at all, again, $10 minimum to get the potential for Creative Vets to win $1,000 um, at 3.30 Central Time, 4.30 Eastern. Please go ahead and, and click on one of these links that says yeah. the bigpayback.org creative events. Or just go to creativets.org and push donate. Or go to creativets.org donate button. And it'll redirect you to big payback. Who's who's doing this live stream, Richard? You're doing this live stream. That's right. I'm talking. Oh, sorry. I'm over here. Sorry. He's got to get it right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. He should make me like a list that I put up on the screen. You know, that's what we're going to do. We're going to give me like bullet points so I can reference this next time. Um, we're getting there. This is the second one, the third one I've done, and uh, it's, it's fun, uh, but I don't know any information. It's very, probably critical. Uh, they're paying me for my, the moneymaker here. Actually, they're not paying me. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, moneymaker that makes no money. Um, but my hands might get some hand model requests if, if all else fails in my photography. Um, but yeah, at 3.30, please, if you can, make a, at least a $10 donation to Creative Vets through the link uh, here on the, the chat and, and on the Creative Vets website and there's a potential that they might actually win $1,000 for programs. So 
Uh, this is my friend Mary Lee. Uh, she has a blog and brand called uh, Happily Gray. And this was at Bonnaroo a few years ago. And we were just kind of running around and having fun. And we decided to get up in the Ferris wheel and, and take some pictures. But uh, in fact, it's that Ferris wheel, but a different year, I think. Uh, this was Red Bull. Um, again, uh, I'm getting into my music culture portion of this. You know, more again, more lifestyle, more fun, less stoic portraits, less produced portraits, more just taking the environment and and leveraging what you have. Um, this is uh, sunset at Bonnaroo. Again, I mean, the, the the dust gets kicked up and the sun is beautiful. And this girl just happened to be dancing around and um, you know, throw a logo over here, put a logo here, put a cool caption in here somewhere and it could be an advertisement so I mean that was the way I shot it um, and uh, that's the way I hope brands kind of see it but you know more in that lifestyle could be a, a, a Levi's type ad or something just very uh, American about this or Americana and festival season and uh, hopefully that will come back soon but uh, the the goal here is to, to try to capture a, a feeling and a vibe. Um, this is my friend Brandon Lancaster from the band Lanco, who's my neighbor. Lives a street away. I don't see him as much as I'd like, but uh, I know he's still back there. But um, this was another fun frame. Again, I was playing off the color and the golds and the and the color and the you know trying to to match these up and pair them up uh, so that they flow well. Uh, Chance the Rapper at Bonnaroo, and this is a, an interesting story. I, I did not know who Chance the Rapper was when this was photographed, and this is right before he took over the world in the, the mixtape hip-hop world, and I saw a golf cart going across the grounds at Bonnaroo, and there were probably a hundred people chasing the golf cart, no, no lie, and got to the the, the Silent Disco, which is where this is right here. If you've ever been to a music festival, the Silent Disco is you put headphones on and you can hear music, but there's no music playing in outside of the headphones. And everyone is listening to the same music. And it's a dance party. And he actually showed up unannounced and played his new mixtape, which is... Uh, so he's everybody's got these headphones on well as, as I walked in th these little bars these little lines uh, that are here was an LED panel behind the, the stage and he's on the stage so I'm I'm on the other side I'm behind the stage and I could only see through these little tiny gaps in these panels of what was going on in fact I really couldn't even see I if, if you you know if you've ever looked at something and then you turn like this you, it, it blocks your view so I had no idea what was really happening. I put my camera straight up to the back. I cranked up my, my uh, ISO, which is to help me expose for a darker environment, and I just hit the button. I, it was a total Hail Mary, and this was one of the images that came out of that, and I loved it. I think it was maybe, I mean, maybe my favorite image I've maybe ever shot at Bonnaroo um, or at a music festival. Just. Not so much maybe because of what it is, uh, but, but who it is, there, there's something happening, it kind of pulls you in, makes you wonder what's going on. But the fact that I took the chance or took the risk to just throw the camera up there, even though I couldn't see, I couldn't tell what was happening, the knowledge of knowing how to adjust my exposure and, and literally try to get some kind of frame. Uh, did we win at 332? I'll have to check it, I'll have to check it. Check it. I hope somebody made at least a $10 donation. Hey, look, if you didn't, um, any donation is, is appreciated. Even, like I said, if it's a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, one million dollars. I mean, if you feel like giving a million dollars, today would be the day. Um, someone said it's not updated yet. We had two donations. One was at $329.57. Whoa, so that's, pretty that's, that's pretty close. Thank you to whoever did that. I'm not going to name names, but uh, thank well, you. We did get a donation from Donald Jenkins. We'll throw his name out there. He was a little bit later. But yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, everybody that uh, that made donations at 3.30. Hey, look, don't stop. I mean, to all you millionaires watching, feel free. I mean, and if you're... those billionaires you shot. Well, the, the billionaires, you know, like I said, they've got their own... They've got people below them that, that do this, I think. Uh, but anyways, but... To, to keep moving again 
they always say, you, like basketball, you miss, like, was it Gretzky? You miss all, shots, yeah. all the shots you don't take. This was one that I, I'm glad I took that risk and, and tried something and got a fun frame. Yeah, for sure that. That's Ricky Bobby. So um, again, a little different, you know, just, I love the colors, the light of the day, the, the just this crazy pattern. And, and I don't know, just I something about it. I loved it. And it could, again, for me, I'm looking at this to, to try to sell this story to maybe an ad, advertising agency who wants to sell a, a feel, you know, or a vibe, or they're looking for something that matches their client's needs. Um, I don't know why every time I see this, I, I, I same thing. It was just a girl at a concert having fun. She's anonymous, but I mean, it could be a, a something for for a headphone company or something for a, a, a instrument company. Or I mean, who knows um, how it could be utilized? But again, just just topping frames. This was a Red Bull thing down in Atlanta. I mean, this was just a dude. And I, I, it says Atlanta there, but for whatever reason, I only see ATL a lot of the time when I see this. And I just love the, the colors and the, the vibe that was, was in this. Uh, my good friend Charlie Worsham playing with uh, Marty Stewart backstage at the Ryman. Um, they were getting warmed up for a, for a performance. I think it was the Opry at the Ryman going on at that time. But, uh, yeah, sometimes being a fly on the wall uh, is, is a lot of fun. You get to... I have a flashback to those memories. Uh, and again, details. You know, uh, sometimes showing a big va vista is not needed. Sometimes somebody wants to tighten in and get tight and, and show, um, you know, kind of a, a moment for, you know, in music. I mean, this again, this could be with the denim that's in there. It could be a Levi's type thing. It could be the company that makes the picks or, a, you know, uh, instrument brand or whatever. Yeah, and I uh, was following Danny Clinch around one day at Bonnaroo for about three hours. They were doing a little small documentary on him and grabbed some fun frames. I just thought this was, you know, and watching how he works and the way I work, he's, he's throwing up a Hail Mary. We call this a Hail Mary. Just throw the camera up in the air and get a different perspective. And for him, you know, he's shooting, uh, you know, on his Leica and, you know, his pretty trademark little hat and... Uh, you know, I never saw the frames that he got from that day, but I'm sure they were great. And this is a guy in the music industry and, and uh, that's been doing it for a long time and is uh, one of those folks that uh, everybody, you know, knows in, in the music industry. We did not win. We did not win. I don't know how someone beat that. I well, think it's a lie. But win. we are winners here because we're all here together. Um, Feel free if you're watching. I, I'm curious where where are you? Where is everybody from? If you're on this little chat. Um, where is everybody tuning in from? You know, we're here in Nashville, um, but I'm curious to where everybody is in the chat is from. If, if anyone's listening, or is this, am I just background noise? Yes, I am. So we're, we've got Brett. <laughs> so Brett's in here, uh, and he is about nine feet from me. So thank you, Brett, for that comment. We are grateful for your enthusiasm. Central Indiana, come on. I, uh, I have not been to Central Indiana in a long time. In fact, I don't know if I've ever been to Central Indiana. Had to have, I had to have. I've, I've driven through everywhere, I think. In this. Yeah, if you go to Chicago, you go straight at 65. Yeah. Louisville, you know what, I was realizing, I, I have not been, uh, I, I think I'm closing out all 50 states. I have not been to Alaska, and I have not been to Hawaii. But I think I have been to every state in the continental U.S. except for South Dakota. Was it North Dakota this past year touring with Chris Young? But I've not. And, I've been I've to not, South Dakota. I've never been to North Dakota. Yeah, I think that's the only state. These are the only. I think I've got three states left. Maybe when I'm allowed to go outside again, I can visit. Watching and working. All these donations are keeping me busy. Good job, y'all. Hit that button. Keep this person working. I mean, we gotta have something happening here. Um, shout out to my mom if you are watching this time. I gotta figure. I gotta teach you how to. No, that's a terrible idea. I'm not teaching you how to get on a chat room. Just getting to the point where 
the texts are making sense. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, well, thank you for tuning in and sharing this. Uh, and uh, to anyone else that I know, I don't know, if you, if you let me know you're watching, I'll, I'll shout your name. In fact, I'm going to do live shout outs for a donation of one dollar because I am I am cheap um, so if we see a donation I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a shout out if you would like me to and I'm just gonna I'm going to make uh, make this interesting it's probably a terrible probably a terrible idea but anyways any donations and I you know again not to be um, redundant but any donation helps these organizations and this is the big payback day um, so it helps with programs to bring veterans to Nashville and then bring them to Chicago and through the arts program and the songwriting program so again thank you for watching hopefully someone's enjoying this and uh, and hopefully somebody saw this little guy over here with a camera and I got the shot that he wanted to get but uh, Again, this is in my music culture. I think, um, you know, uh, the hardest part of being, well, living in Nashville, I think one of the hardest parts is the automatic assumption that everybody shoots music. Uh, it's it's kind of true, but not everyone shoots music well. Not everybody can take portraits of people. Not everybody can light. Um, not everybody can tell a story from a concert um, or to shoot a show. And not that I shoot a lot of live music anymore, um, the one the, the things that I do, I want it to be through a brand or through an agency that wants to help tell a story and, and capture a, a moment or a feeling. And um, you know, for, and to show my book, if I showed nothing but live show shots, I'm probably not going to get hired very much um, because there's a billion people out there who are shooting live music, and unfortunately, it's the nature of the, of the industry. It doesn't pay very well, and you have to have your own. Uh, reasons for doing it and um, you know I try to explain to people that you know for me I would rather show them the, the, the culture because there's more of a commercial value to that than than shooting nothing but live show shots uh, because that could be anywhere uh, or, or any, anybody the, the 50 people right down here all these people with cameras in their hands and all these people with cell phones have now just they're all gonna get the same same shots you know, be somewhere else if you're going to do it. Try to tell a story in a different way. And, um, you know, hopefully that will resonate with people who will actually hire you. Um, if your aspiration is to be a commercial photographer or to be someone who makes money doing this, um, you know, making sure you're doing something different and better than everyone else around you. Uh, I don't know why. I just kind of love this. William Clark, Clark Green. He's a Texas artist. I just love this frame. It's blurry and a little messy but he was recording his music in the studio so i i enjoyed enjoy that frame um again showing the crowds uh, these i've got so many crowd photos that are crazy but i just kind of love the fact that this guy was going for it and this poor girl down here at the bottom is like get off me um and it's always loud and, and again sometimes being on stage is great because you don't have to be in the middle of that mess even though being in the middle of that mess can be enjoyable if you get a good frame it's not when you are getting older and uh, get stepped on and pushed around in a pit but this is one of my favorite live music frames uh, this is Matt from Cage the Elephant and he is a lot of fun to shoot because uh, he is like a Mick Jagger he is all over the stage and it is wild um, and I know there are some great frames of him but I love this image because it's anonymous you don't know who it is unless I tell you um, and for me, it's like sports. I think shooting sports and shooting live music are very similar because you have to, it's hard. You, you don't get a chance to do it over. Um, if you miss the touchdown catch frame, you're, you know, they're not going to do the same thing again. Same thing with live music, especially considering most of the time live music is very dark, not well lit. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to get a captivating image and you know it, it, it's the, the best out there do it well and there's a lot of a lot of folks who just grab a frame and that becomes their image but try to get something unique um, this was 
years of experience matched with luck and and the ability to have just a great moment and be in the right place at the right time. So uh, this is Big Frida backstage. Um, I didn't want to invade. I don't like invading artists' personal space before a show because they're trying to get their heads right and remember their lyrics and plan for the show. And uh, this was a moment where I was outside the dressing room, outside the green room, and I was trying to be a fly on the wall and just caught this look and uh, I just love this frame. Again, I, now we've switched gears. We're going to more uh, kind of a, a different vibe, but I didn't know where to make that break. But uh, I was talking earlier, if you've been watching, about the lifestyle images. Well, when I was bidding on this project for Hertz, they kept saying lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. Well, this is what was in their head. And this kind of thing was what was in my head. And again, it, it's it's subjective, and I think this is where if you're if you're watching and you're and you're not a photographer, but you're interested in the stories of this, and you're going to hire a photographer, have some visual examples so that the, the photographer can understand what it is is in, that you expect, because lifestyle, lifestyle, completely different, you know. Um, but whoever, the, the person making the request, to them, this might mean one thing and, and, and to you it's another. So you have to, especially when you're putting a bid together, and, and, and sometimes when we put treatments together as commercial photographers, we, we, we try to put relevant images to get them, uh, to get the people making the decisions really excited and thinking, oh, this person gets our vision. Well, if we, don't, if we don't know what your vision is, if we're not getting all that information, um, it's pretty hard to put something together that, that reinforces that we understand what you want to accomplish. So I'm glad that we got to that point and we were able to figure it out because it was a great shoot. We shot down in Fort Lauderdale and then we shot here in Nashville and um, a whole archive full of images about their services. Again, here's another image. Um, we, we had talent and wardrobe and styling and you know all the things where you know, you might see this in an advertising campaign or in a magazine or at the on the website, uh, you know, just showing what it is that they do. So, um, you know, we, uh, we had a great shoot. Again, lifestyle. This was shot here in Nashville, and this was for uh, uh, an ad agency in, out of Detroit called FCB, or uh, Chicago, and it was for Michelob Ultra. And uh, again, it's with Sean Booth, who's a celebrity fitness trainer and um, you know we had to have the right kind of bottles and we had to have a prop stylist and we had to make sure there was the right amount of you know condensation and moisture on the bottles and it's you know it's a lot of work it takes a it takes a team to put this together um, this image and, and, and most of what these images were going to be used for were going to be used in a in a stand-up that was going to be like this so a lot of this a lot of this probably never even got seen but we uh, we shot it anyways and, and let them let the client crop it to what would have worked for them. So uh, this is Ronda Rousey um, in Memphis. This was for the WWE. I was there shooting portraits and behind the scenes of, I guess it was uh, WWE and 2K Sports. Um, they, uh, they were doing the new um, video game and so we, we had some behind the scenes images from that shoot and I mean from that from the uh, the commercials that were being made over a three or four day period and this was shot in the convention center the Memphis the convention center in Memphis um, which was totally rented out I mean there were huge sets built in this convention center to get the different environments because uh, they were shooting all this content and it, each each set had to be completely different so a lot of fun uh, Sean again but uh, this is kind of getting into my fitness world um, when I first started I shot a lot of athletes uh, sports because that was I played sports in college and I knew it and it was something that made sense to me so I would get that call a lot uh, early in my career and it turned into um, getting opportunities for apparel brands and uh, sporting brands and uh, and even editorial assignments. This is an editorial assignment for Running Magazine um, because I had things in my portfolio that 
they liked and it was it gave me the ability to give them confidence that I could shoot what they needed. So this is uh, this is for head down eyes up by uh, an apparel company that uh, country artist Chase Rice owns. Uh, obviously golf. I still shoot a golf tournament once a year down in Florida called the Honda Classic. It's um, it's a PGA Tour event. Um, this year will be my 10th year uh, and uh, sometimes you, you get jobs out of other jobs and this is the case. This was um, Sergio Garcia for Adidas and Ricky Fowler and Puma and just love this frame. This is Tiger Woods. Um, I have other frames of Tiger Woods and portraits and I just, I don't know why, I just love this frame. Just, I don't know if it's the way it lays out or the color or the, the, the depth. Um, not wearing Sunday red, but you know, it's, for me, I just, I like this frame, so I wanted to include it. Uh, this is for Skechers. This is out in LA, and uh, I've done a little bit of work with Skechers over the years, and uh, we were doing the Skechers golf, uh, the, the apparel and the, and the footwear. And this is for Skechers in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho with Matt Kuchar, who's a PGA Tour professional. And um, this is um, one of the most beautiful locations I've ever been on. Uh, this golf course, it's called Gauzer Ranch, I think. Way up in the mountains. And I mean, that was probably a, oh, I don't know how many thousand foot drop down to that lake back behind us, but um, just some amazing views and amazing um, locations. We scouted the day before, we found the, the locations we wanted to get to throughout the day, and we just, the next day, we would go and set up at each location, and we got, I don't know, five or six different locations on this golf course to, to help, help them sell their product through imagery. And uh, that's the second book. So um, I am going to show, I guess, we've got, and again, we have two people who are going to be entered uh, to win some, some prints here. And I'm going to, um, you know, answer any questions that people may have. If you want to ask some questions about portfolios, portfolio building, um, really any, any specific questions, I'm here uh, probably for another We'll make it another nine minutes, but uh, also feel free to donate. Anybody that donates today will be entered to win um, a print. And I guess I will let, I don't know how we're gonna do this. We will have to start narrowing this down, but I will start putting them out. So we got a print of Randy Hauser that I took uh, backstage a few months ago. Uh, Paul McDonald. These are 11 by 14, by the way. Um, again, this is Justin Moore from that someone might have seen earlier. Serena Williams. Uh, this is Margot Price backstage at Bonnaroo right before she went on. And this is Sean uh, again. And let's see, Janet Kramer. There's Kelsey and Jason. We have Ray Mysterio. We have Mariana Rivera, here's that action shot of Cage the Elephant. We have a solo image of Aldine. We have uh, P.K. Subban, who's a, who, uh, here's a funny story. So I had, this is for, I've been for years um, pitching to ESPN the magazine. I felt my style and the way I shot worked well. I thought my subject matter that I had in my portfolio worked well. Um, and I, I always felt like it was a great fit. For whatever reason, I never got an assignment from them until this shoot. And it was, it was, it was kind of a, it was a, a, a fashion section in ESPN the magazine and, and P.K. Subban is, had been known for being really fashionable, wears a lot of cowboy hats. He's not even playing for the Preds anymore, but um, I got the call, we got there. Everybody on, on his team knew, and this is during the playoffs, so when they came in, they were pretty focused on getting to work. And, um, but he knew I was gonna be there. We got there, we got set up, we had a plan in place. It was supposed to be really kind of candid. And I had two assistants and we had two lights and uh, we were just gonna follow him in and grab some frames and whatnot. Well, he got there, said hello. 
asked what I want to do. I said, just walk back and then just walk through. Well, I, I got off nine frames in that pass and he just kept going. He just kept walking down the tunnel and never saw him again. Um, and honestly, this was probably the only decent frame of those nine that, and it, and it worked and it ran and they printed it and now they're going under. So, um, I can say I, I shot for ESPN, the magazine and, um, the check cleared and, uh, you know, and I got a frame and I got some other, well, this is the only frame from that, but it was, uh, it goes to show you sometimes you only have a few moments, um, then we have uh, like Mark from Midland, and then this was fun. We were just playing around uh, in front of a no selfie sign and using the fake hundreds here. Another shot of Mariano Rivera, and let's see, another shot of Jana Kramer, and then we end where we started with Claire Bowen. So. Uh, Again, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. I can answer a couple more questions quickly if uh, anybody has any. You're very welcome. Um, I'm, you know, we're, we're gonna probably do some more of these in the future, and we'll be more specific and uh, and, and take some time and think about specific areas of photography that people want to learn about, whether it be again portfolio building and, and how to put that together and the why and, and creating a portfolio to um, maybe, you know, emphasizing, um, you know, working on, uh, on uh, comp uh, composition or learning about exposure or learning about specific industries. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to do this for my friends here at Creative Ed. So thanks again and please donate if you can. Uh, you can go to creativevets.org and uh, donate um, at any time, not just during Giving Tuesday, but there are a lot of, uh, or the big payback, I forgot what day it is. But uh, you know, just knowing that every dollar that you uh, do donate, and I know there are a lot of worthy um, organizations out there, but goes to help uh, people um, learn about and, and, and thrive through art. Um, and it's, it's, it's a pretty powerful thing, so. I don't know uh, what you to do stare, now. Stare at the camera. I'm just gonna we'll stare. Let's stare. see. Let's have a staring. staring let's have a staring contest. I, I already blinked. Yeah, or is that part of the? Is that part of the? You got four minutes. You can't get off work early. I can't yeah. get off. I have four more minutes. Oh, I didn't know. I don't. I, I don't know how this all works. I just talk and talk. Well, actually, how long is that after video? A minute. So I don't know. Minutes. We're just. Uh, so we're just we're having fun. Sit, outro, tell well, people to donate. I'll make well, sure gear is ready. I think I said all that. Well, yeah. Let, if uh, I'm just gonna wave. Just wave for the people. Wave to the fans. Listen, thank you to all my fans for showing up. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna. I, I, I always want to be an influencer. Um, so you know, I'm gonna do some makeup and hair hair uh, routine uh, videos if anybody's interested. It's my my hair routine and makeup is pretty easy. It's uh, so anyways. Oh. So we'll, we'll, do the, we'll do the outro now. We're doing outro. We love you guys. Thank you guys. We are a nonprofit that's helping combat disabled veterans heal through the arts and music. Our art programs in Chicago and California help combat disabled veterans tell their story through art. We enroll them into the best art institutes in the country. We pay for their tuition, their housing, their food all three weeks so that they can finally tell their story through art. We also bring combat disabled veterans to Nashville, to places and rooms like this here at the Grand Old Opry, to tell their story for the first time with pro songwriters all about the things that they went through that they've never been able to talk about before. These programs have been extremely successful in helping veterans combat their PTSD. Right now, Creative Ed's has more veterans applying for our programs than we do funding. So if you can go to creativeets.org and donate, we would appreciate it.